Hi guys and welcome back to a new video. Today I am back with a solved true crime case all the way from the states that happened back in the mid late 1900s. So a bit of a change from my previous French cases. I figured I would cover this case now. I have been wanting to cover the Glen Sheen Mansion murder for so long and I finally got around to like researching it enough to make a video on it. So I'm really excited. This will be a two-parter. I apologize if you prefer everything to be in one video, but there's just way too much to cover. Um, so please subscribe if you want to um, make sure you don't miss the next one. This video is essentially the story behind the Glen Sheen Mansion murder. And the main person involved in both videos is Marjorie Congdon who is the granddaughter of multi-millionaire Chester Congdon. She is hands down one of the most fascinating characters I have ever heard of um, for multiple wrong reasons, but I do think you'll appreciate this video. So um, I'm done. I'm done with the intro. <laughs> Let's just dive right in. Just a heads up, this video will mention maybe mental health issues, as well as the loss of children. Without further ado, let's just dive right in. Hopefully this video won't be too long. The second one might be a bit longer, but here we go. Chester Congdon was born in Rochester, New York on June 12th, 1853. His dad, Sylvester, was a minister. His mother, Laura, was a stay-at-home mother who went on to have five children after Chester. Chester was the eldest and he went on to have five siblings. Unfortunately, three of the six died of scarlet fever in 1868 and Sylvester, the father, died of complications from the scarlet fever just a year later. He was only 42 at the time, which left Chester, the eldest, at the age of 15. He was made to be in charge of the family now. He was the man of the family. And as a result, he had to basically grow up very quickly. Um, he was so young, but he really decided to step up and replace his father. He moved to Corning where he could get a job in a lumber yard and he would send money to his family just to help out his mom and siblings. And I think this situation kind of propelled him into having a successful life and a financially secure future where he never had to be in this position again because that was a huge responsibility for him as a 15 year old but to be honest he actually did great he made the most out of the situation he actually graduated college as a valedictorian and he got into the yale law school program which is quite an achievement unfortunately they couldn't afford the law program at Yale, so he ended up just going to Syracuse, New York to study law, where he met Clara Bannister. They met in math class, they hit it off, and they quickly fell in love. In 1877, he passed the New York bar, and in 1880, he passed the Minnesota bar. So quite, quite a smart young man. He waited until he had a secure job as assistant of the state district attorney before marrying Clara. And Chester and Clara went on to have a few children of their own. They had Walter, Edward, Marjorie, Helen, John, Elizabeth, and Robert. Sadly, John died of scarlet fever as well, just like Chester's siblings. So that was devastating to them, but they still had six children to look after. In 1883, Chester quit his job as assistant and he started his own practice. He wanted to make it on his own, but he also started investing in mining stocks. He was very interested in the entire mining industry. Um, his former boss, William Bilson, offered him a partnership in his own law firm. So of course, Chester accepted and he kept looking into this whole mining situation. And with working at the law firm as a partner, he started making some very important connections. He ended up making money almost overnight. He was incredibly successful financially because of the stocks he owned in mining and because of the investment he had into the mining procedure. He had bought some land, he had figured it out, he took a risk and it paid off. And in no time he was making money like he never had before. All six of his children would have, were, of course, very, very well educated. They went to the best schools. 
They were raised in a very loving family, but obviously Chester had very high expectations from his children. They wanted to make, he wanted to make sure that they had the best future for them. And because he had so much money, he still expected them to make their own way and get the best from his financial situation. In 1903, Chester and Clara had their own dream home built near Duluth on Lake Superior. Chester had purchased 22 acres of land and he decided to have a masterpiece of a house also known as Glensheen Mansion built and it was designed by architect Clarence Johnson. Um, it took six years to build. In 1909, the mansion was complete. It was finished. It cost $750,000, which in today's money is well over $25 million. So that's to give you an idea of just how rich Chester Condon had gotten. That's how much money they had. That He basically built a dynasty. Um, the mansion had 39 rooms. It is a stunning, stunning property with a stunning view on the lake. And it actually, it was named Glensheen because it was in a wooded area. So that's where the Glen part of the name came from. But also the Congdon ancestors were from a town in England named Sheen. So they put the two together and that's how the mansion got its name, Glensheen Mansion. Elizabeth was the second youngest and she got to spend the most time in that house. Um, the children got to spend also quite a lot of time in Washington State where Chester had another house built because if you can afford a 25 million mansion, you can probably afford a little second house in Washington State. Unfortunately, he didn't really get to enjoy much of it because he passed away in 1916 at the age of 63. He was a very organized and savvy man. He made sure that his children would be provided for and that they would all keep access or maintain the rights to Glen Sheen Mansion um, and that the unmarried ones, the unmarried children he had would have priority over the house and all five of his six children went on to get married but Elizabeth remained single for the rest of her life so she ended up living there full time. Elizabeth was actually very close to her mom, Clara. Um, they had a lot in common. They both loved reading. Um, she would read to her all of the time. And after Chester passed away, Elizabeth dropped out of school or left school, should I say, to move in with her mom and stay with her mom. Now, because they didn't have to work, they had a lot of free time. That's the, the glory of not having to work and being millionaires. But they kept incredibly busy. They were involved in so many activities and clubs. They never had a spare moment. They were very, very active. A few years later, Elizabeth got engaged to a very, very handsome and popular man named Fred Wolven. He was known as a ladies man, but once he met Elizabeth, he knew she was the one. He bought her an engagement ring, a beautiful diamond ring, which she never actually wore on her ring finger, which was very strange. She would pin it to the inside of her bra, which sounds incredibly uncomfortable, but for whatever reason, she never put it on display and I guess it wasn't too surprising when she later broke up the engagement, um, which devastated Fred. He was never the same after. He was so, so upset and devastated that he threw the ring into Lake Superior and he never dated anyone else after Elizabeth. To be honest, Elizabeth never seemed to care much for relationships or boys. She had she had no interest in marriage, to be honest. She had two best friends, Julia and Caroline. She would spend most of her time with them. They would go traveling all over the place. But after she turned 30, throughout her 30s, Elizabeth did want children, which I guess is a bit surprising if, you know, if you're not too interested in marriage or a relationship. In the 1930s, you also can't really just have a baby like you might be able to these days. That never stopped her. Elizabeth was not the type to be held back. So when she was 38, she went to the East Coast on a trip and came back with a three month old baby girl named Jacqueline that she renamed Marjorie after her own sister. And she, she yeah, she just came back from a trip with a three month old baby. Um, and she told her family and friends she had adopted her. Um, she was the, the daughter or the baby of a teacher who had gotten pregnant out of wedlock. Elizabeth wanted a baby. She just went and got herself a baby. What can I say? Um, a lot of rumors were going around that this was actually Julia's child, 
but that was never confirmed. It's just that she, Marjorie, resembled Julia quite a lot. So that was the rumor at the time, but again, nothing came of it. By the age of two, Marjorie needed very, very thick glasses because of her very poor eyesight, which made her stand out and feel different from the other kids. And that would go on to affect her self-esteem pretty much probably for the rest of her childhood at the very least. And a year later, when Marjorie was three, Elizabeth went on another trip to the East Coast again, and she brought back another baby girl again. She had adopted a girl named Jennifer, who would become Marjorie's little sister. This time, people rumored that Jennifer was actually Elizabeth's own daughter. I'm not sure why. I think it's just because she resembled Elizabeth more. She was this very, very fair-skinned blonde gorgeous baby girl whereas Marjorie was a beautiful baby girl but she had very straight black hair and she had a darker complexion so the two were quite opposites and they would go on to be opposites in personality as well um, but again I'm not sure why people thought this would be Elizabeth's actual biological child because generally speaking I from what I researched it seemed like <laughs> Elizabeth wasn't into boys nothing that was never confirmed, that's just kind of speculation, but I don't think she was into men. So um, I don't think Jennifer was actually um, Elizabeth's actual child. Now Marjorie was not happy at all with Jennifer joining the party. She felt like now she needed to compete for her mother's attention and she kind of hated it because Jennifer was this bubbly, gorgeous, blonde haired, like little baby girl that everybody loved. She was just fun. She adapted to every situation. She just fit in immediately. Whereas Marjorie felt like she kind of had to fight to fit in. She was more introverted. To be honest, I feel like she never really tried to fit in. Um, people were less into Marjorie than they were into Jennifer. And obviously Marjorie felt that. Around the age of eight, Marjorie started displaying some very strange behaviors, such as she, laughing in a very strange way or pulling her hair out when she thought no one else would notice, which is kind of unusual behavior. I must say, first of all, a child laughing out of nowhere in a creepy way when no one's watching might be the creepiest thing ever to me, but you know. That's just how Marjorie was from a very young age. She just seemed strange and different um, and she probably felt it and maybe other people noticed it and it was kind of like a, a never ending cycle. Elizabeth herself was absolutely not qualified or prepared to deal with Marjorie's behavior and instead of putting strict boundaries, which probably would have helped Marjorie, she would kind of purchase or buy her love and her good behavior. She would buy her toys, she would buy her pets and animals, um, clothes, anything like that. Whenever there was an issue, she'd be like, oh, here's, let me buy you something. If you behave, I'll give you this. Little did Elizabeth know this started a lifelong pattern of bad behavior with money that would kind of follow Marjorie throughout her entire life. Elizabeth herself, as I said, she was really, really into reading. She was also really into needlework. This was the early 1900s. There's nothing else to do. Both girls were very well read. Um, they loved reading as well. And Clara, their grandmother, was more than happy to teach both girls some very, very intricate needlework. Marjorie herself, to be fair, was incredibly well read and well spoken. She was very, very smart. Um, and she, again, was also really good at needlework, so she had that going for her, but Jennifer overall just seemed to still come out on top. She was just way more um, easygoing than Marjorie, so they did both very well in school, but whenever they had to change elementary schools, Jennifer was excited and kind of blended in with the new kids, whereas Marjorie just struggled. Marjorie obviously never felt like she fit in, as I've said, especially when Jennifer was doing everything so flawlessly. She was making it look so easy. And as I've said, Elizabeth kept buying things for Marjorie, but that never seemed to soothe Marjorie, who really felt like her own biological parents had abandoned her. She never recovered from that emotionally, even though I guess some people from the outside could argue that she got adopted by a very, very wealthy woman who gave her everything. That doesn't remove the fact that, you know, if you're adopted, it's very likely that you might at least once think of the fact that your parents 
had to give you up, whatever the reason was, Marjorie never came to terms with that. By the time Marjorie was 12, she had already started stealing money from Elizabeth's purse and she would go to the mall and buy stuff with her mom's money. And when I mean, when I say she was buying stuff, she would literally go to the mall and buy like four to five cashmere sweaters without thinking about it, without asking her mom. Um, of course, you know, that wasn't Marjorie's money. That was her mom's money. And even if she had plenty of money, that wasn't the point. Um, this behavior was quite alarming and Elizabeth tried to put a stop to it. She contacted the mall and told them if Marjorie shows up and wants to buy something, tell her she can't unless she has a signed note from myself, which just basically taught Marjorie how to forge her mom's signature and found a loophole so she would still end up buying stuff on her mom, it wasn't like a credit card, but basically charge her mom for all the things she would buy at the mall with a fake signature. And around that time as well, um, there was a small fire that had started in the basement of that department store of the mall, but nobody ever found out what the cause was, but that was the mall that Marjorie went to all the time. During high school, Marjorie did make a friend. She had a friend named Anne Payne and they would ride horses together. They would rent these horses from a stable and Marjorie had this gorgeous, gorgeous horse named Greyhound. She was obsessed with the horse. And after a while, Elizabeth decided to buy the horse for Marjorie. Of course, Marjorie's a teenager. The horse requires a lot of attention, a lot of care. She wasn't interested in providing the care for the horse. To be honest, I don't know how much she actually wanted the horse. I just know that Elizabeth purchased the horse for her. And of course, when she saw that Marjorie wasn't looking after the horse, she was like, right, well, maybe this was a stupid purchase after all. Let me sell this horse to someone who's gonna care, like give the horse the proper care and look after this horse. That was unacceptable to Marjorie. Marjorie was like, look, I never said I didn't want the horse. I just don't want to take care of it. And one very, very important thing about Marjorie is that whenever she didn't get something, if she couldn't have something, no one could have it. And that is probably the best way to describe Marjorie for the rest of these two videos. That was Marjorie in a nutshell. If she couldn't have something, no one else could. So she took matters into her own hands and before Greyhound had even the chance of being sold to someone else, a servant walked into Marjorie force feeding oatmeal laced with pills. Now she ran away as soon as the servant saw her, but he confronted Elizabeth and let her know what had happened and Unfortunately, it seemed like nothing came of this situation. I don't know if Elizabeth ever spoke to Marjorie, but she was finding out just how concerning some of her daughter's behaviors were. So that was one of the first incidents that was witnessed by a third party. In school, Marjorie was doing really well when it came to literature, reading, anything like that. But when it came to math and algebra, she was completely at a loss and what I mean like she couldn't do math I don't mean like she was struggling look a lot of people don't like math or don't really get it but she genuinely could not understand a single thing when it came to math and that's just my speculation like I don't know if that's what happened but it's possible that she had dyscalculia dyscalculia all right we'll say dyscalculia I'll put it on the screen. You'd think I would look this up before starting a video, but it's possible that that's what she had and that's why she had issues with numbers, but also it would explain issues she would have later on with her spending. That's just something I noticed. Again, this was never confirmed, but she really, really struggled with math and algebra. And by the age of 18 anyway, she was still stealing from Elizabeth. Um, so Elizabeth kind of got sick of it and she was like, right, this really isn't normal. This isn't just like a teenager acting up or trying to steal like pocket money. Um, she decided to have her evaluated and then put into an outpatient program, which I, I don't know if Marjorie accepted or just kind of like had to do it, but um, the results of the evaluation was ne were never made public, which makes me think that it probably would have made Marjorie look bad or maybe at the time made was bad news so Elizabeth never shared that with anyone. In September 1950 Marjorie met Richard Leroy in St. Louis. They were having dinner at the same boarding house and they started talking. She really really liked him. He was good looking. He was tall dark and handsome and it's an actual miracle that she managed to get his attention because not to be you know rude but 
from the way she was described, she really was not much to look at. She didn't have like this award-winning personality, but physically she was kind of like short and stout. Is that from that song, The Teapot? But like she she was just kind of like short and square and she didn't really have any defining features. So Elizabeth was actually quite surprised that she managed to get Richard's attention. Now Richard was this fantastic, good-looking, smart man and he just really liked that um, Marjorie was very well read. She was obviously very, very smart and she was very dynamic. She was just very stimulating. And then of course Marjorie loved that Richard was a very good listener. That was important to her because she had a lot to say. <laughs> I can relate. He was a casualty underwriter for an insurance company and she told him that she was in St. Louis to take nursing courses after leaving Washington University because she didn't really like the program there. He believed it, that's what she told him. She wasn't doing any of that, so that's what she made him believe. On June 30th, 1951, Richard was 24 and I believe Marjorie was only 19. They got married in the living room of the Glensheen Mansion and they had a lovely two-week honeymoon in Brule, which is where Elizabeth owned a farmhouse, a beautiful farmhouse. And after their honeymoon, they moved back to St. Louis in Missouri. And the honeymoon phase, not the honeymoon, the honeymoon phase did not last long at all. Barely two months after their wedding, Richard was being chased by debt collectors and creditors regarding unpaid bills, which he was like, what do you mean? I pay my bills. I give the money to, um, I give my money to Marjorie for like food and like whatever else she needs, but that's about it. So when he confronted Marjorie about it, she was like, oh wait, I can explain. <laughs> it's my mom who's been running up these bills in your name. And he was like, well, hold the dang phone here. Like, your mom's a freaking millionaire. <laughs> like, I don't think she's running up debt in my name. Something seemed very fishy. So he contacted Elizabeth, who had to basically snitch on her daughter and say, um, I'm sorry, she didn't tell you before you got married. I thought she would, but she has a huge spending problem. And this is Marjorie basically overspending. Elizabeth really liked Richard and she actually did feel bad for him because she knew exactly what her daughter was like. So she ended up, oh my God, unnecessary. I hope you can't hear this. So she ended up sending $3,500 to cover that debt. And that was the first of a long line of bailouts that she would have to give Richard to help Marjorie out because basically Marjorie would spend and spend and spend and Richard did not have the money to make up for it. Elizabeth felt bad. So to help Richard, Elizabeth asked the trustees to allow Marjorie to get the interest on her trust fund a year early. She was supposed to wait until she was 21, but it couldn't wait. Elizabeth thought maybe if she has this interest income from her trust, it would help her with the debt. Um, so she would be getting six to 8,000 a year, which was more than what Richard was making working, um, which is, you know, at the time, a decent income to have for nothing at all. She wasn't working for it. Um, but the guaranteed income, the guaranteed income wasn't enough. You can't outrun a bad diet and she was overspending a decent income. So at 25, she actually got access to another trust that Elizabeth had set up when she adopted Marjorie. And now she was getting a net like 25,000 a year on top of the six to 8,000. So now she was getting over 30 grand a year, just purely free money from what her mom set up. And despite that income, she managed to dig a $25,000 hole, a $25,000 debt, because she would just spend, 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 spend. And then whenever the debt would show up or whenever the bill would come, she would basically just let Richard deal with it. She's like, all right, you got this <laughs> and just bail. So um, Richard was honestly kind of losing it. Um, he had to turn to Elizabeth quite a few times because he genuinely could not afford to cover this debt and Elizabeth again would oftentimes bail him out. Surprisingly, Richard and Marjorie went on to have seven children. 
Stephen, Peter, Suzanne, Andrew, Rebecca, Heather, and Richard, and we'll call Richard Rick to not be confused with his own father, Richard. So they had seven kids. Halfway through all of these children, Marjorie kind of got tired of how small their house is, even though he loved living there. Richard absolutely loved that house. And she was like, look, I'm kind of tired. You're not making enough. And this house is too small. We have too many kids and they were about to have more. So she went behind his back and bought a house they couldn't afford. And El again, Elizabeth had to bail them out. I think this time it was like a $32,000 bailout to help them out because Marjorie just went ahead and bought a house they couldn't afford. As soon as her kids were old enough, as soon as they were no longer like infants, she basically left them with Hester, who was a babysitter who would be there throughout the day. And she would just go and shop all day. So she would just leave her kids at home and be like, all right, see you tonight. And just go and shop and spend money she didn't have. Um, at some point she got into antiques and she was like, oh, let's just redecorate. I'm really into antiques now. And Richard was like, put his foot down. He was like, we cannot afford antiques. We can't even afford to breathe. And that wasn't good enough for Marjorie. You don't say no to Marjorie. She was like, fine, I guess I'm going to girl boss my way into this redecoration. And she did because they came back from church one Sunday and found their dog and the neighbor's dog in the living room and all of the furniture was destroyed. Now it was very obviously slashed with a knife so the dogs hadn't done any of the damage. Um, Richard saw right through it and especially because before going to church Marjorie was the last one to leave the house and she was running late to the point where he was waiting in the car with the kids and he thought they were all going to be late to church, but she was like, coming <laughs> after slashing all of the furniture in her living room. And then they came back from church and he was like, hold up, <laughs> what's going on? He was absolutely um, like, what's the word? Bewildered, but also incredibly concerned by what had just happened. And she just straight up phoned the insurance company he worked for and just said, hey, these dogs destroyed my furniture. She got money, she got compensation and then bought all the antiques and redecorated the living room. And Richard was just like, what the fuck? Like just absolutely stunned, but also incredibly alarmed. That was Richard. Um, he wanted to leave the marriage. He was sick of it. He couldn't afford to be with her anymore. He couldn't afford anything but he had seven children that he loved. He wanted to stay with them. And he also really, really got along with Elizabeth and Richard was a really good guy. So he decided to stay with Marjorie, but he really, really was at the end of his rope. As much as Marjorie loved to spend money, she actually spent quite a lot of it on others. So she wasn't particularly greedy. Um, she just had a spending issue and I think she wanted money that she didn't have and she would find a way to get it. But when it came to spending, it's not like she really spent much of it on herself, actually. Um, even if it was to redecorate the house, technically, I guess you could say that's what she wanted. But I think she was more, the spending was what she wanted. But she was more than happy to excuse that spending by, you know, buying things for others, including her children, who also got the best education. They had the best clothes. They had the best hobbies. She decided they were all gonna be figure skaters. In 1962, she turned up to the ice center in Minneapolis and with seven kids of very different ages. And she told Manette, who was a figure skating, a figure skating coach, that she wanted private lessons for her children, but she wanted like the lessons to be for her seven children. She didn't want her kids, you know, sprinkled through various lessons with kids their age. She just wanted one class for her seven kids and Manette was like, well, they're very different ages and levels, so maybe that's not the best idea. Marjorie was like, for the love of God, just do what I'm asking you to do. I will pay you. So she did and Manette thought it was a little bit silly. But despite this, Marjorie woke the kids up at 5 a.m. every damn day to train for two hours before going to school and then they would train again after school. Now, four of the seven kids kind of dropped out of skating. It just wasn't for them. So they would do something else like horseback riding. But she was just um, very intense with her training, kind of like a tiger mom when it came to 
extracurricular activities. Richard, he was struggling. He had to drive these kids everywhere on top of being at work all day and everything, his entire lifestyle and dealing with Marjorie's antics kind of affected his productivity at work. Um, he really, really suffered through this. He was absolutely miserable. I'm sure some of the kids were as well, but she ran a tight ship so they knew better than to complain, but I'm sure it was really hard for them as well. Very intensive. Steven was the eldest. He was by far the best at skating and o over time he's the only one who would stick to skating. They all kind of stopped skating. Um, because Marjorie would attend every single training session for skating, she got quite close to Manette and she actually became good friends with her. The kids would often play together. Manette had kids of her own, so both families, the kids would play together. Marjorie would buy tickets for any comp like any plane ticket that Stephen and Manette needed to get to a competition throughout the country, she would pay for them. But Manette actually did know just how unpredictable Marjorie was. Um, you could be her best friend one day and then the next day she'd be your worst enemy. She would it'd kind of be like riding a roller coaster. You never know which version of Marjorie you would get. Um, Manette's husband absolutely despised Marjorie. He probably saw right through her. He really didn't care for her, but he did get along with her husband, Richard. In 1965, Elizabeth unfortunately had a stroke that left her partially paralyzed. Her entire right side was paralyzed. She had trouble speaking, communicating, and pretty much doing anything on her own. So she got a full-time nurse who helped her throughout the day. She also had a nighttime nurse who would help her get ready for bed and keep an eye on her if she needed anything throughout the night. And they would both kind of help her communicate. In 1966, 12 year old Suzanne noticed that their garage was on fire and she actually panicked. She saw her own garage on fire. She ran inside to find her mom who was facing the window through which you could see the garage on fire. And she ran up to Marjorie and said, mom, mom, the garage is on fire. But she never looked up from her murder mystery book. She was reading a book and she was like, don't worry about it. Like she literally just said, don't worry about it. And the fire was getting worse. Suzanne was really panicking. So she's like, mom, the garage is on fire. Like, are you not seeing this? And she said, I told you to not worry about it, Suzanne. And she didn't know what to do. Luckily, uh, Richard was pulling up as the garage windows were exploding. So he phoned the firefighters, but by the time they arrived, it was too late. There was nothing left of the garage. Very strange, um, very, very strange incident that, you know, Richard saw right through. And again, he was incredibly concerned and alarmed. In 1967, Marjorie turned 35 and she got access to all of the money from one of the trusts that Elizabeth had set up. She had so many trusts in her name and somehow still managed to spend more than what she got. This time she got almost $290,000 in cash and she also had some stocks that she would end up selling for quite a lot of money. Elizabeth set up two more trusts in 1968, but for those trusts, she made sure that Richard was the one in charge of them so that Marjorie wouldn't immediately have access to the money. So she would let Richard in charge of the trust. Does that, it makes sense. You know what I mean? She didn't trust her own daughter with money. So although the trust was in her daughter's name, it was mostly to help the family out. She made sure Marjorie wouldn't have direct access to it, but no one has ever stopped Marjorie, to be honest. She always found a way. While Marjorie was having issues with Manette, purely because of stuff that Marjorie did, um, she met another friend at the ICE Center named Helen Hagen. This is a very important name, so please remember it for the next video, but Helen Hagen was basically just as wild as Marjorie when it came to um, training their kids. They were both just on the sidelines, just like shouting like fault or whatever, just like some soccer mom, but for skating. They were very, very fierce and they kind of hit it off. Um, they became good friends. Although Helen was quite different, she basically spent a lot of time on her own. Her husband, Wally, was an electrician who would have to travel for work quite a lot, so she was alone on her own. But she loved her kids. She really took good care of her kids. And they, even though they weren't, you know, identical in terms of personalities, Helen always could count on Marjorie. If she ever needed to speak to anyone, even if it was in the middle of the night, Marjorie would pick up. 
Um, Marjorie would help her out financially if they were struggling. So they did become good friends and then they kind of lost touch for a little bit. But that is Helen Hagen, remember that name. Aside from the issues with Manette, Marjorie learned that Stephen didn't want to skate anymore. He got sick of it and she was like, I don't think so, you're still skating. So he went on to win quite a few gold medals. He won gold medals for the United States. She, he won a Canadian gold medal. He even won gold medals in international competitions. He was a very, very accomplished skater. And he ended up twisting his ankle, which meant that he had to retire from skating, which was likely a relief for him because he was kind of done with it. But this was devastating to Marjorie, who had no idea who she was without skating in her life as a mom. So she felt a bit lost after that. In 1971, after 20 years of horrible, horrible marriage for Richard, he finally sued Marjorie for divorce on the grounds of cruel and inhuman treatment. He was done. She had driven him to financial ruin. Emotionally, he had nothing left in him. He was depressed. She kept buying things no matter how indebted they were. He had gone through so much stress and emotional distress that when it came to, you know, suing her and he had to describe what she put him through, he did not hold back. On top of her outrageous spending, she forged his signature to access money in the trust set up by her own mom. The ones I said were left to Richard to kind of look over. Marjorie was having none of it. She forged her husband's signatures to access the money. It took her less than three years to blow through $290,000 and Richard estimated that between 1958 and 1971, she spent up to $1 million on various things. It was also estimated that Elizabeth bailed them out of a third of that debt. On top of that, she was a bit of a nightmare socially. Again, Marjorie always stood out. She always felt different. She would make really rude comments to people. Um, a lot of her friends would kind of stop being friends with her because she just, you know, again, you never knew what version you would get of her. They didn't, she wasn't that likable overall. Um, she did have some good friends, very, very few good friends that she kept, but the rest of the people kind of figured out that she was different and strange and they just left. She eventually turned all seven of her children against Richard. She lied and said that he had been unfaithful, um, which was very sad because Richard loved his kids and he was never unfaithful. Um, so she basically turned them against their own dad. After they divorced the following Thanksgiving, Elizabeth invited Richard over to Glenshine Mansion for Thanksgiving. <laughs> she didn't invite Elizabeth, uh, she didn't invite Marjorie. She really cared for him. She also couldn't be bothered with her daughter. So she just invited Richard and Stephen ended up joining them. And when Marjorie found out that her eldest son had betrayed her and joined his father to spend Thanksgiving with her own mom, she had a huge fight with him. She kicked him out. So he had to live with Richard instead. Marjorie claimed that she never wanted to get a divorce, which is probably true, even though she never seemed happy in that marriage. Very strange. Um, she got very bitter and angry more than usual. So she fought for custody of her seven children, or at least the ones who weren't 18 yet. And she won. So Richard basically got nothing. He got to keep his own car. That's it. She got the house. She got access to the money. She had access to her own children's trusts and bank accounts, which um, concerned Richard and Elizabeth. As you can imagine, she went on to drain all of those accounts. She faked all of her children's signatures and it was up to a total of $250,000. So when the children were of age and they wanted to use their money, um, the money that was saved up for them for like tuition, they found out that their mother had completely rinsed the accounts. And that kind of helped them kind of slowly realize why Richard left and slowly over the years they ended up reconciling with their dad. In 1974, Marjorie bought a house in Minnesota and she had it remodeled by someone named Mike Billingsley. She very quickly discovered that he was very unhappy in his marriage and she, well, they started an affair over the summer of 1974. Mike and Marjorie were basically going to get married as soon as he 
was finally divorced from his wife, but in the meantime, he left his wife and bought her a wedding ring. Um, by 1975, though, Marjorie decided to kick him out. She was done. She didn't like him anymore. She broke the engagement and just left him to fend for himself. And he had left his wife, but wasn't officially divorced. And now he basically was on his own. She was just like, nah, actually, no thanks. So she kicked him out. She did buy another house in Englewood, Colorado. She decided that they needed to move to Colorado with Rick because Rick had really, really bad asthma and he needed to join a clinic. And obviously the other two youngest children, Rebecca and Heather, were also living in Colorado with Marjorie. Now this is where it gets interesting. So at some point in 1974, Marjorie decided to stop by Glensheen to pay her mom a visit. Elizabeth had already had her stroke. She couldn't really do much for herself. So Marjorie brought over some homemade bread and jam and she was going to prepare breakfast for her mom and feed her her breakfast since she couldn't really eat much on her own. Everybody knew that Elizabeth was diabetic. So when Marjorie showed up with the bread and jam, the nurse said, look, you can give her the bread, but she cannot have the, the jam because she's diabetic. And Marjorie was like, it's fine. She'll have the jam. It's going to be great. So the nurse got concerned and phoned Dr. Bagley, who was Elizabeth's physician, who knew Marjorie a little too well. And she told the nurse, like, look, there's no point trying to argue with Marjorie. She'll have it her own way. She'll, she'll do things her way anyway. So just tell her it's okay to give her jam. Just really don't give her a lot. Give her a small amount because she's diabetic. Marjorie was like, cool, okay, let me make this sandwich. She went to the kitchen to make the, the jam sandwich um, and then brought it upstairs to feed her mom. And the next morning, Elizabeth could not be woken up, which alarmed the nurse and Dr. Bagley rushed over, took a blood sample, and over the next few hours, Elizabeth slowly started waking up, but her blood pressure was still very low. Her heartbeat was very slow. It took her quite a few hours to come back, to get back to normal. And when the blood test results came back, Dr. Bagley found out that there had been meprobamate, a tranquilizer, in the system, which, you know, she wasn't prescribed at all. And the doctor was absolutely convinced that Marjorie had poisoned the jam and tried to murder her own mother. On May 12th, 1975, another strange event happened, though I guess you can say it's not so strange after all. Joyce Elsop, who was an old, old friend of Marjorie when she used to work at the mall, bumped into her at the Minneapolis, nope, bumped into her at the Minneapolis St. Paul airport and she recognized, I mean it had been years, but she recognized Marjorie. She saw her and she was quite excited to like just say hi. But Marjorie basically made eye contact with her and just rushed past and just completely left her like on her own, just didn't even say hi. And Joyce was quite upset. But what she didn't know was that earlier that day, Marjorie had stopped by her house in Minnesota, the one she had bought before she met Mike Billingsley. And she was in a rush. She was at the house in Minnesota. And I'm not sure if Mike still lived there or stopped by frequently, but he pulled up to the, he pulled up to the house and noticed that Marjorie was home. And he was like, oh shit, I don't want to deal with her. So he was like, okay, what is she doing here? It doesn't matter. It's her house. Let me leave quietly. And Marjorie was actually so preoccupied and in a rush that she never noticed that um, Mike had seen her so he left and she was busy moving furniture from the main house to the guest house that was not attached to the house so she was moving all this furniture and like these trophies she was obviously very very busy but kind of acting like she was in a rush um, he left and a few minutes later a neighbor drove past the house and saw huge clouds of smoke coming out of the house so uh, as soon as he was con like as soon as he was sure that there was no one inside the house that needed rescued he rushed away phoned the fire department unfortunately by the time the fire department or the firefighters arrived there was nothing left of the house the guest house was fine though so don't worry but what's interesting is that mike still hadn't been paid by marjorie she still owed him a hundred grand for the remodeling he still had some investment into the house 
So he would get nothing from it because it had now been burned down to the ground. And the house was insured for $430,000. However, what Marjorie did not know is that the insurance had expired on the house, which is also what saved her because she quickly became the prime suspect. Mike had seen her there. They had the round trip plane tickets, the witness at the airport. She had been in and out of Minnesota in no time. And when she spoke to police, they were quite convinced that she was the one who started the fire. But because the insurance had lapsed on the house at the time, you could not be charged for damages you do to your own house if you don't have insurance on it. Like if you own a house and you want to burn it down to the ground, I guess you could because it's your house and you're not trying to scam like the insurance company. So I don't I don't think she knew that the insurance had lapsed, but either way, it saved her from being charged because she absolutely set that house on fire. Just over a year later, she was the prime suspect for another fire that had started at her own bank, the own branch she used in Englewood in Colorado. She basically matched the exact description of a lady who left the building telling the night supervisor, by the way, there's a fire on the fifth floor. And turns out there was a fire. So when he spoke to police and police investigated this and questioned Marjorie, she just said, I was at the bank because I bank there and I had some banking stuff to do at the bank, which, you know, why else would you be at the bank? I guess that's a good enough reason, but very suspicious stuff. Unfortunately, because nobody saw her start the fire, she could not get charged either, but she was starting to have a little bit of a pattern of arson. At the beginning of 1976, Marjorie met Roger Caldwell at a Parents Without Partners meeting. She was feeling very lonely. He was feeling very lonely. She missed being married. He had just been divorced. He had lost custody of his kids. She presented herself as an heiress who had seven children. So he's like, perfect, I can be a dad to your seven kids. And two months later on March 20th, 1976, they got married. Very, very, um, very, very short engagement. Roger was absolutely not a special man by any means. He was, he had a very forgettable face. He didn't have a good career. He, he had absolutely not much going for him. He wasn't a bad person, but he was nothing compared to Richard, who was quite a catch. Um, and he also, basically his previous marriage had fallen apart because he had started drinking and he worked for a couple of months for a little while. He worked after they got married, but he quickly kind of stopped and then the drinking, uh, became worse and he would basically abandon Marjorie for a couple of days. He would go on benders and she would just be left looking like a clown. Um, Rick at the time, her youngest son lived with them. Um, they lived in a really nice ranch in the Colorado mountains. The bank ended up foreclosing on that home. So they had to move to a two bedroom in a motel, which is, you know, a stark contrast from the 39 room mansion she grew up in. As I said, Rick was with them at the time because he was the youngest and he witnessed quite a few fights. Roger would get really drunk and he would get a bit abusive and violent. And Rick had to unfortunately break up quite a few of their fights because if you think Marjorie was the type to just stand there and take it, she was not. So she would get angry and fight back. Um, which I guess is, I mean, you know, I, I, I'll defend her there. She was with someone who would start drinking and become abusive. That was... Um, no fault of her own and not a situation anybody should be in. But unfortunately, Rick witnessed quite a lot of it. Um, despite all of this, Marjorie insisted on turning Roger into this other man. She basically tried to turn him into like a Colorado rancher. I don't even know what a Colorado rancher looks like. Let me see if I can find out. But aesthetically, she turned him into this man he wasn't. He didn't even like horses. He hated horses. Um, any ranch stuff. Anything she was into, he had no interest in. He didn't really care for shopping, ranch stuff, whatever it was she was into, he he just didn't care. He wasn't into it. They clearly had nothing in common. The fights never got better because on top of his drinking, she would keep outspending 
what they earned. Um, so it caused a lot of financial stress and they would just fight more over that. In May 1977, the summer house that was close to Elizabeth's farmhouse in Brühl was broken into. It That house, the house that was broken into, belonged to one of the trustees of Elizabeth's estate and he was one of the people who had to ensure that Marjorie would not get money out of Elizabeth's estate or trusts. So everybody knew what Marjorie was like and they immediately all thought that she was the one who broke into his home to steal the silverware because obviously she knew the land well, she knew where the house was, she knew when the servants would be in or who was occupying the house at what time. She also had a history of, you know, fires. Wherever she would go, there would be a fire. And whoever had broken into the summer house had also tried to start a fire, but it wasn't successful. Ironically, a few days later, Marjorie, who still needed money because she needed to spend more and also pay off her debt, put Roger in charge of asking for $750,000 to launch a horse breeding and horse racing project that he had absolutely no interest in. And the person he had to ask was none other than Bill Van Evra, the man whose summer house had just been broken into. Marjorie knew that if she showed up to ask for the money, he'd be like, absolutely not. So she sent Roger to try and look professional. She sent an alcoholic to negotiate a project that required a capital of $750,000 and Bill was like, absolutely not. So he gave him zero money. And since Roger was in the area, he was like, let me meet this mother-in-law of mine since we need her money. So he asked Elizabeth if he could drop by. I'm really sorry guys, my camera died and I have to finish with my phone. This is so unprofessional. So well, I'm back to the fact that Roger was in the area and he finally wanted to meet his mother-in-law so he asked Elizabeth if he could stop by Glen Sheen Mansion and she was like, cool, I guess I'll meet my new son-in-law. You have 15 minutes and she was not joking. She probably would have extended it if she enjoyed Roger's presence but she really cared for Richard and Roger was no match. Um, she gave him 15 minutes and then that was it. So this man spent about 15 minutes inside the house before she sent him on his way back to his hotel room at the Radisson in town. About a month later, on June 24th, 1977, Elizabeth spent the weekend in her farmhouse in Brule and Stephen was in the area so he decided to drop by. He was incredibly polite and well-mannered. He was such, all of the grandchildren were terrific. Um, so El Elizabeth was thrilled to have Stephen over for the weekend. So he stopped by and they spent some time together at the farmhouse and usually Elizabeth would leave Monday morning to go back to Glensheen Mansion, but because Stephen was leaving Sunday afternoon, she decided to leave at the same time. So this was a bit unusual. The day nurse, Mildred, tried to find cover for that night since Elizabeth would be back at Glensheen Mansion. She needed someone to be there to look after her and the night nurse, who she usually had, was still on holiday. So she asked Velma Piatila to look after Elizabeth just for that one night and Velma was actually Elizabeth's old night nurse or at least old nurse. She had since retired so she knew Elizabeth very well. She knew exactly what Elizabeth needed done. She was familiar with the house and Elizabeth. So she agreed. Um, her husband asked her to decline. He's like, you're retired now. You don't need to go. It's so far away. It's just a weird mansion that's isolated. And she was like, you know, I kind of miss Elizabeth. Um, don't worry, I'll just do it this once just to, you know, help her out and that's it. It'll just be tonight. I'll be back tomorrow morning. Unfortunately, on Monday morning when Mildred came in at 7 o'clock to take over the nurse shift for the day shift, she found Velma lying near the staircase and she actually thought that Velma had fallen asleep. She was like, oh my god, that's so unprofessional. She also thought, wow, that's a weird place to fall asleep and it took her a few minutes to open her eyes to the very gruesome scene that was in front of her. 
Velma was covered in blood, there was blood all over the walls, and Mildred immediately ran up to Elizabeth's room to check on her, and when she walked in, she found Elizabeth with a satin pillow on top of her face, and when she removed the pillow, she found that Elizabeth had already passed away. Both Velma and Elizabeth were already dead when Mildred showed up, although she didn't initially realize Velma was dead, she thought she was just unconscious, and Mildred, first of all, was absolutely devastated and shocked by what she had just seen, and she couldn't understand who could possibly want to harm them, um, especially Elizabeth, because she it didn't look like it was a robbery, nothing was really missing, so it wasn't like a robbery gone wrong, but she, she absolutely could not understand who would go out of their way to harm Elizabeth. As soon as Jennifer found out that her mother had been murdered, the first thing she said was, Marjorie did it. And although Marjorie had some pretty ironclad alibis for that night, her husband Roger did not. And that's where I'm ending the video for today, guys. Uh, Bit of a cliffhanger, but believe me, the second video is even more fascinating. I'll be talking about the crimes of Marjorie Congdon, so please subscribe so you don't miss out on the next video. Um, yeah, I, I shouldn't behave this way, but I am <laughs> so excited about sharing this story with you guys just because for me it's absolutely insane what Marjorie went on to do. Um, and yeah, that's... I'm gonna stop talking now. But I hope you enjoyed this video. Let me know what you thought of this so far and I will do my best to post the next one for next week. In the meantime, I hope you guys had a great weekend and I will see you in the next video. Bye.